ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ان شاء الله تعالى we continue with كتاب التوحيد and we had reached chapter لا يذبح لله بمكان يذبح فيه لغير الله is that 10 or 11 11 okay so the title of the chapter again لا يذبح لله بمكان يذبح فيه لغير الله which is uh, right after the previous one which talked about الذبح or slaughtering for the uh, for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a matter of shirk since this is a matter of ibadah qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin la sharika lah wa bidhalik umirtu wa na awal muslimin that indeed my salah and my nusuk the nusuk is the slaughtering and my life and my death is all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is ibadah like the sujood like the dua slaughtering is to be only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're not talking about the fiqh matter of it but we're talking about the matter of the tawheed there is if someone slaughtered to the jinn or to uh, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to someone that is dead, the subject of sacrifice. Uh, these matters, if it's not done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then this is a matter of shirk associating partners with Allah. The next chapter, which is La Yuthbahu Lillahi Bimakanin Yuthbahu Fihi Lighirillah, which means not to slaughter. For the sake of Allah, in a place where people would slaughter in it for other than Allah. To that extent, as you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected this deen, cutting all the leads and the means that would lead to what is evil. And this is how this religion is beautiful and well structured and strong. Nothing is left. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade something, he would also forbade the things that would lead to it. And therefore, one of the things is this subject. لا يثبح لله This is the title of the subject. Someone is slaughtering something for the sake of Allah, not for any other uh, thing whatsoever, only for the sake of Allah and even in the proper way and saying Bismillah. But in a place where people would slaughter in the place for the sake of other than Allah. So where there is shirk is committed in that place, then it is not permissible for a muwahid, someone upon the tawheed, to slaughter there for the sake of Allah, to avoid and to stay away completely from what leads to a shirk, which is the worst thing that can ever happen on the face of earth, associating partners with Allah. Uh, and then he mentioned uh, one verse and one hadith. One verse and one hadith. And we might go to the next sub- uh, chapter, if Sheikh Faisal allow us, inshallah, uh, 45 minutes or so, inshallah ta'ala. So, uh, and we'll see the benefits also, inshallah ta'ala, after the chapter is mentioned. Uh, the ayah is وَقَوْلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى لَا تَقُمْ فِيهِ أَبَدًا لَا تَقُمْ فِيهِ أَبَدًا And this is in Surah At-Tawbah, Surah number 108. The verse is part of a verse that talks about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade the Prophet والسلام, from praying in a masjid, al-masjid, masjid al-Dirar. The masjid was built by the hypocrites. It's a masjid, it's a house of worship, supposed to be but was built by the hypocrites for an evil reason, to uh, be a refuge for the enemies of Allah when they come, uh, to uh, go against the, mes- the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. So the intention of it was not for the sake of Allah, even though it's a masjid. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade the Prophet ﷺ from praying there, and that masjid was even destroyed. So something that was supposed to or to look to be a masjid or a place of worship but he used this verse uh, as, a, as an evidence clearly that how the la taqum, do not pray there, do not establish the salah in this masjid at dirar that the hypocrites, they built to commit sins and to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the same thing applies if there is a place where people would commit shirk, associating partners with Allah, do not slaughter in that place, meaning for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that place is, is meant for people to commit shirk. So it's the same manner. So the hadith is 
doesn't have to be directly as an evidence to this, but it shows the principle of it. Uh, the, the verse, I mean. Then the hadith is clear in the, in the subject, and he says, عن ثابت بن الضحاك رضي الله عنه قال نذر رجل أن ينحر إبلا ببوانا I'll Read the hadith first, inshallah ta'ala, and we go word by word, inshallah. فسأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال هل كان فيه وثن من أوثان الجاهلية يعبد؟ قالوا لا قال فهل كان فيها عيد من أعيادهم؟ قالوا لا فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أوفي بنذرك فإنه لا وفاء لنذر في معصية الله ولا فيما لا يملك ابن آدم يقول رواه أبو داود وإسناده على شرطهما So Thabit ibn al-Dahak radiyallahu anhu He's the narrator of the hadith He said نذر رجل أن ينحر إبلا ببوانا A man, رجل, نذر نذر that means he made a vow He made a nether A nether is when someone makes something that is permissible He make it as an obligation upon him And there are different categories of a nether And this also leads to the next chapter But without going into uh, details well, Maybe we'll, well, if we have time we can talk about this So he made a nether That means he made a vow That a person would say It has to be uttered with one's words it cannot be an intention in the heart it has to be said clearly that a person would say that upon him, that he obligates upon him or he, it's, uh, it's, it's upon him to do this. Especially if it's a matter of ibadah, that he would pray that many rak'at, that he would slaughter uh, an animal or whatever there is, whether it's conditioned or not conditioned. If he passes his exams, he will do this. If uh, he, uh, he's sick, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him cure, he would slaughter an animal. All of these types of things, it's called a vow. And whether this is something permissible or not, uh, of course it's permissible unless certain conditions when a person would make it as a condition. Some of the ulama, they said it's makruh or even not permissible because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that will come inshallah. One of which is you making something as an obligation upon you when you had the ease not to have any obligation upon yourself. So anyway, so this man, he made an adhr and once a person makes an adhr, then he has to fulfill it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers that they are yufuna bin nadhr. They fulfill the nadhr. If there is a nadhr, a vow upon them, they would fulfill it. So this man made a nadhr. So that means the nadhr has to be fulfilled. What is the nadhr? An yanhara ibilan bibuana. That he would yanhar, an nahr, is the slaughtering of the camels, which is uh, the way that they slaughter the camel is that they would stab it in the neck and then they move the, the knife to slaughter it. Different than when you slaughter uh, a goat or a sheep, for example, because of the camel, the same thing can be applied for the cows. It starts with stabbing, and then it goes with, you know, cutting the jugular vein. So uh, here he made another that an yanhar, and both, uh, in, uh, whether, whether it's a sheep or a cow or anything, you can use the word an nahr, but the nahr is specific for the camels or the cows. So he made another that he would slaughter ibilan, uh, uh, which means camels, Bibuana. Buana is a place, is a specific place, uh, right by Yambo or something of that place, uh, close to the sea. So he made another to slaughter camels at a specific place. So the Prophet والسلام, والسلام, the man asked the Prophet والسلام, to should he fulfill his vow or not. فقال, the Prophet والسلام, said, and this is الشاهد وهذا هو point of reference here. He said هل كان فيها وثن من أوثان الجاهلية يعبد؟ Was there any وثن, any idol from the idols of the jahiliya, of the idols of the people of ignorance يعبد being worshipped in that place? The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام is asking him this place called Buana was there an idol that is being or used to be worshipped by the people of jahiliya, the people of ignorance? قالوا لا. They said no. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, قال, فَهَلْ كَانَ فِيهَا عِيدٌ مِنْ أَعْيَادِهِمْ Was there in that place, عيد, عيد is celebration, مِنْ أَعْيَادِهِمْ from their celebrations. And the word عيد in the shar' uh, is not just any celebration because people, they can get together to celebrate for a newborn, for example. You know, or celebrate someone, mashallah, finish the Qur'an. It's okay. But العيد is comes from the same word, something that يعود, something keeps on coming back. So they set a date, whether it's on a yearly basis, 
This is the year that or every, every year on a specific day they would celebrate something, which is basically the holidays or the things that the people every year it has a specific day. This Eid of this, Eid of that, the day of this, the day of that. Or monthly or even weekly, as long as it keeps on coming back. Uh, so this is what is called Eid, that people keep on going back and f- back o- to it over and over again. So are there any Eid? And the Eid is a special thing for any people that have cultures or religions. So that's why there is no Eid is permissible uh, in the deen of Islam except Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Any other Eid is not permissible. So the Prophet والسلام, again, without going into so much details, he said, were there any Eid of their Ayad, the Ayad of the Jahiliya? which is based on shirk and, and worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was there uh, any of these ayat established in this place? قالوا لا. They said no, O Prophet of Allah. So then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ أَوْ فِي بِنَذْرِكَ Fulfill your nether. That means then, fulfill your nether. No harm to fulfill your nether in that particular place. Uh, then the hadith continues, فَإِنَّهُ لَا وَفَاءَ لِنَذْرٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ Principle. That the Prophet ﷺ said, indeed, there is no wafa, there is no fulfillment of any nazr, of any vow, in the disobedience of Allah. So if someone made a vow that he would commit a sin, should he fulfill it? Of course not. It's not permissible for him to fulfill it. But he said he would do it. He made it an obligation upon him. Or he even swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would do it. Someone made it upon himself to commit a matter of shirk. This was done before, for example, he was a Muslim. Or to commit a sin, it's not permissible. What should a person do in that case? Before we continue with the hadith, he should not fulfill his nether, his vow, if it's uh, sinful. But then he has to expiate for this nether the same way that he would expiate by taking an oath. If you take an oath and you're not able to fulfill it, then you expiate. How do you expiate for it? By feeding uh, 10 people or clothing them, either way. Or if a person is not able to, if a person is not able to feed 10 people or to clothe them, then to fast three days. And freeing a slave is not uh, existing nowadays. So uh, this is the expiation of an oath. So that applies here. If a person is not able to fulfill the nether because if it's a, it's a sinful one, وَلَا فِيمَا لَا يَمْلِكُ إِبْنُ آدَمْ The other thing is no fulfillment of the nether or the vow if a person is not having the ability to do it, doesn't have the capacity to do it. Someone made a vow that he would free a slave. He made it upon himself, uh, whether it's with condition or not. Because the vow, the nether, either with a condition or not. A person would say, if I, again, pass my exam, I would free a slave. There's no slaves to free. But he made a vow. What should he do? He should then expiate for it, as if he made an oath and he's not able to fulfill it. Or someone made a vow that, a nether, that he would fast 10 days, if this happens. Or making a nether without a condition. Just making a nether upon himself to fast 10 days. And again, as we said, this is not something that is good to be done. It's disliked or even some said it's not permissible because you make things tight for you. So, but he said this, that means it becomes an obligation. He's not able to do it. He falls sick, a permanent sickness. So what should that person do? Uh, Expiate for the oath by feeding 10 people if you have the ability to do so. So the two conditions, as mentioned in the hadith, where the vow is not to be fulfilled, if it's in uh, in a matter of a sin or a person does not have the capacity to do it. And this hadith is sound, Rahu Abu Dawood, wa isnaduhu ala shartihima. The isnad, the chain of narration of the hadith, is upon the conditions of Al Bukhari, a Muslim, and it's a sound hadith. Hafid ibn Hajar authenticated and others. So, uh, what is the, again, the hadith, the point of reference? And we should learn from the hadith of the Prophet, والسلام, the ulama learned from it many great benefits. One of which is the questions of the Prophet والسلام, is very obvious. Why would he ask, was there, if, if the answer was yes? Was there an idol of the people of Jahiliyyah has been worshipped there? If the people said yes, what would be the answer? Do not fulfill your nether. That's why he asked alayhi salatu wasalam, and the same thing with the Eid, with the matter of festivity or celebrations and things like this. So this is a clear ruling here, to stay away from slaughtering in a place where people are committing shirk there. A person might say, but in the slaughterhouse, people are slaughtering, uh, you know, whether it's by shooting the animal or not slaughtering or not slaughtering in the proper way or they're disbelievers and things like this. This is different. You know, it's the act of slaughtering. They're not doing it in the proper way. But in a place where people are slaughtering for other than Allah, for 
some form of a cult. They, they sacrifice. Or they say in the name of these individuals, or Jesus, for example, in the name of that person in, you know, in the grave or whatever there is, then you don't slaughter in that place. Then you stay away. If someone says it to himself in a silent way, you don't know. But a place well known where people would sacrifice or do these matters of shirk is to stay away from it. It is not permissible. Um, there is uh, you know, many benefits that he mentions here. Uh, Eleven uh, points. The first one, the tafsir of la taqum fihi abada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbidding the Prophet والسلام, from praying in the masjid at Dirar. And of course, the, the evidence of that or that how it's used because the masjid has been built for matters of sin. The second one, أن المعصية قد تؤثر في الأرض وكذلك الطاعة. A great benefit here. The sin might affect the earth and the same thing, the good deeds. You know, the earth, um, it's, it's uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, people would, would do something on a spot on the earth, matters of shirk, it affected that spot. To stay away from doing the same thing in, in the proper way, in the tawheed way, because of the spot. And of course it's very obvious as it's going to be mentioned, because this can be the ri'ah, can be a way for the shirk to be revived again. Because this used to be in the past. So if someone does it, does it again and he slaughtered it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people might might revive to them what they used to do of matters of evil, and the shaitan has his ways in this. And the same thing with the acts of obedience to Allah affect the place. And there's a physical effect when it comes to sins and good deeds. It affects the places that people live in, in their homes, their countries, all kinds of things. And as we heard in the verses recited in Salatul Isha, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the people of Lut. Sin is committed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. So the sin affects the land that a person lives in, it, and, and the same thing with matters of good deeds, the barakah and the blessings and so on. The third point, رَدُّ الْمَسْأَلَةِ الْمُشْكِلَةِ إِلَى الْمَسْأَلَةِ الْبَيِّنَةِ لِيَزُولَ الْإِشْكَالِ Very uh, important principle also. You have a mas'ala, a matter of the deen, that is uh, mushkila or mushkal, there that means it's difficult, uh, or something that is not clear. So how can you deal with something that is not clear? Bring a mas'ala that is clear, and you would refer that ruling to what is clear, so that the matter becomes clear. And this is something that, uh, of course, the people of knowledge, they use in matters that might be new or something that is complicated or things like this, to bring it to what is clear. What is clear is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade uh, something, so that means it's forbidden, a person staying away from it, and to stay away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbidden, therefore, to make it in such a, in such a clear way. استفصال المفتي إذا احتاج إلى ذلك uh, the other benefit is that the mufti, the one that is going to give the answer, is tifsal. He's asking to make the matter very clear. Uh, so that's why the Prophet ﷺ asked. And there are many examples of this. You know, is it permissible for a person to go to that place? Then he asks, what's wrong with that place? Is there sins in that place? You know, to ask to make the matter clear. And uh, as a result of that, he would give the verdict. Uh, the next one, تخصيص البقعة بالنذر لا بأس به إذا خال من المنع. It's okay to specify a spot uh, to make a nether in a particular place as long as there's no موانع. Nothing would prevent uh, the person from fulfilling that nether because of a sin again. So if someone, for example, made a nether that he would slaughter an animal in his hometown, that it has to be in his hometown because the nether is according to what a person say. His statement becomes as if it's deen, because he made it as a deen upon himself. So, and of course, the intentions uh, has a great uh, objective in there. The next one, المنعو منه إذا كان فيه وثر من أوثان الجاهلية ولو بعد زوالي. That how it's forbidden to fulfill that nether. If there was an idol from the idols of the days of ignorance, even if it was removed. The place now doesn't have any idols being worshipped besides Allah, but because they used to, do this in that spot, then it's not permissible to do it there. Uh, because of, again, uh, cutting all the leads that might lead for reviving matters of shirk. The next one, number seven. The same thing if there's a Eid of their Ayad, festivities and so on, that they commit shirk in it, even if it get removed or it's not there anymore, to still stay away from uh, doing any matters of ibadah or celebrations in these places. The next one, أنه لا يجوز الوفاء بما نذر في تلك البقعة لأنه نذر معصية. Whoever makes or fulfills the nether in that spot 
which is not permissible, then it becomes a sinful nether, so therefore it's not permissible to fulfill it and then to expiate. Number nine, al-hadharu min mushabahati mushrikeen fi ayadihim walau lam yaqsid to be warned against imitating the mushrikeen, the disbelievers in their ayad, in their celebrations and holidays and so on, even if the person does not intend it to imitate them. When it comes to imitation, uh, it doesn't have to have an intention. A person doesn't have to intend that he's imitating the disbelievers. He doesn't have to have this in his heart. Just the fact that he's doing something like them with uh, regards to what's special for them. Not anything, just uh, the things that is related to their religion or something that is unique to them. Then a person has to stay away from imitating them in what's unique in their way of life and things of that nature, even if he does not have the intention. So it does not uh, need an intention. The, and that's the same thing with sins. Sins are sins. Even if a person doesn't have the intention to commit a sin, it's still a sin. Number 10, لا نذر في معصية. It's not permissible to make nether in a matter of sin. It has to be halal, of course. And when it comes to this nether, uh, you know, there's types of nether. There is a nether when it comes to the ta'a, which is what's mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, as it will come in the next chapter, the hadith of the Prophet, whoever made a nether a vow to be obedient to Allah, then let him obey Allah. So a person make a nether to fast or to make salah, then he has to fulfill it, of course. Uh, if it's another of ma'asiyah, sin, then it's not permissible, of course, to, uh, to fulfill it. Uh, there is the third category, which is another al-mubah. A person making another that he would not wear this uh, thobe uh, whatsoever. This is nothing. But if a person make this upon himself, this is not how another is. Another is to make ibadah, to make ta'ah, to make an act of obedience to Allah. Not for these you know, permissible matters. But if a person make it upon himself, not, we're not talking about swearing by Allah. Different. If someone says, by Allah, I would never wear this. Uh, and it's uh, something that is of no benefit, then he should wear it and expiate for his oath. But if he makes another, he would say, it's upon me. And whatever words that would mean that it's an obligation upon him, that he, that he would never wear this, or he would never go to that place, has nothing to do with deen or ta'a or ibadah, then in that case, it's not another, but still according to what is Allahu A'lam to the correct opinion, and to be away from differences of opinions, he still have to expiate for that nether. If he says it, even he's not making it as an oath, he still should expiate for this nether by feeding 10 people. If he's not able to do so, then to fast three days. And there is nether al-lijaj, they call it, or al-ghadab. Nether al-lijaj, or al-ghadab, is when someone is angry, so he makes a nether. Uh, you know, someone got him angry, then he did not swear. Swearing is something else. He says, upon me that I would never do this. Uh, or I would do an act of ibadah or something like this. This is also, you know, whether it's disliked or not permissible, but it has to be fulfilled. Or a person expiate. Especially with the one with the anger, some of the ulama, they say it's better to expiate and not to fulfill it. Because it's, uh, again, he said it at the moment of anger, but he has to expiate for it. Or if he doesn't want to expiate, then fulfill the nether. Uh, the last one, لا نذر لابن آدم فيما لا يملك. No nether, no vow in something that the human being uh, is not able to fulfill. If he's not able to fulfill, then uh, there's no nether in this case. Uh, with this subject, someone uh, might ask, you know, people, for example, they purchase a place which was a, a church and they make it as a masjid. And this is one of the good deeds, actually, for a person to do so. So, uh, you know, this is, it's not the same. And it's different than this, the matter of slaughtering. Why? Because a place that people would worship other than Allah, they completely look different than when the Muslimin takes over and they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can easily differentiate between a church and a masjid. If you enter a place, this is a masjid or a church, it's a masjid. So the, the action is completely different. As they say, tawheed versus shirk. But when it comes to slaughtering, this is what the essence of what mentioned in the chapter as the ulama they say. If you look from a distance, someone is doing it upon the tawheed and someone is committing shirk. They're both doing the same act. The ones that are doing shirk, they're not dancing or doing some rituals. No, they're just slaughtering. But they're slaughtering for the idol. The idol doesn't have to be there, by the way. It's just some words that a person would say. And he is committing shirk. 
versus someone else is doing it upon the Tawheed. So when al-mushabaha, when the similarity in the actions was there, and when, when someone look at them from a distance, they all look the same. So the forbiddance came here to avoid any, uh, you know, problems in people understanding things or things becomes complex or not clear for people. So to avoid the shirk whatsoever. You see this, this point? So this is something that the ulama in the mention, which makes it very clear, the issue of the slaughtering. The, uh, the next chapter, if you don't mind, it's just uh, two verses and a, a short uh, wordings of the hadith related to this. Min al-shirki al-nadhru li ghayrillah. From a shirk is to make nadhr, vow, to other than Allah. So the previous one, slaughtering in a place for the sake of Allah, but in a place where people would slaughter for the sake of other than Allah, it's forbidden. Here, min al-shirki al-nadhru li ghayrillah. From a shirk is to make nadhr to other than Allah. Uh, the first ayah, in Surah Al-Insan, yufuna bin nadhr. The believers, they, one of their characteristics, they fulfill their nadhr. If they made a nadhr, if they made a, a vow, they would fulfill it. The next ayah, وَمَا أَنْفَقُتُمْ مِنْ نَفَقَةٍ أَوْ نَذَرْتُمْ مِنْ نَذْرٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 270. Whatever you spend of any nafaqa, small or, or big, أَوْ نَذَرْتُمْ مِنْ نَذْر Or you made a vow, any vow, whether it's small or big, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. So again with nadhr even, if you're alone in a room and you said words of nadhr, then it's upon you. But you have to say it with, a, with, with speech, you have to say words. It cannot be intentions in the heart. So if someone alone, no one is witnessing, and he says upon himself that he would do this, then it's a nadhr. So some of these types of things between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is binding. And the same thing with human beings, so a human being. Uh, in the past few days we were talking about the waqf, endowment. You know, al-waqf, when you give something as an endowment, a building, for example, apartment, apartment building, that you would give it and uh, not to be sold, it's going to be there. And the benefits from it, renting it, will go to whatever specific uh, directions that you want to specify for poor people, for uh, this and that, it doesn't matter. But if a person says it, that he makes this place waqf, or whatever words that would give that meaning, then it's a binding contract and it's forever, cannot changed, cannot be changed. He cannot come the next day, he says, I'm sorry I took this back, too late. If he says it, it's gone. It's like a masjid, masjid is waqf. This place is waqf. Meaning, can anybody sell that place? No, of course not, right? And some places where they would have to have an individual, right? To have the ownership of the place with an individual's name. This is uh, the legality of things. So you find a masjid under the, the name of a person, but it's waqf, right? That means it's not permissible for that person to sell it. Legal, legally wise, he can do this, but it's haram, of course. It's haram to sell a masjid. It's waqf. Uh, unless that's a matter of necessity, this is a different situation. So anyway, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. So the words that a person says becomes then obligatory upon him. The only hadith mentioned here, وفي الصحيح عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من نذر أن يطيع الله فليطيعه ومن نذر أن يعصي الله فلا يعصيه Very clear, من نذر, whoever نذر made a نذر, a vow, أن يطيع الله, that he would obey Allah. How can a person make a نذر with the obedience of Allah? I will fast, I will make a salah, I will give charity something of matters of obedience to Allah, then فَلْيُطِعُهُ Then he should obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill his nadr, and it's an obligation upon him if he does this. وَمَنْ نَذَرَ أَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهِ And whoever make a vow that he will disobey Allah, then فَلَا يَعْصِهُ He should not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what should he do? He should expiate for the nadr, which brings this clear uh, principle and foundation in the deen that never changes whatsoever. Uh, no obedience for any makhluk, for anyone, in the disobedience of Allah. So whether yourself, you made it upon yourself to commit a sin, never do this. If you swear by Allah that you will commit a sin, never to do it, but expiate for the oath that you took. If you promised someone, if you wrote a contract, and the contract in it that you would commit a sin, and we know that al muslimun the Muslims, they should uh, fulfill their, their covenants. This is haram. Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu awfu bil uqood. Or you will believe, fulfill the, the contracts. It's haram to break a contract that you signed it and you agreed to it. But there was a condition there that is sinful. 
then it's not permissible to fulfill it. Uh, then take upon yourself the losses and things like this, unless it's a, a necessity again, then you ask a major scholar to, to get yourself out of it. But it's haram to fulfill something that has a sinful act or something that is clearly haram. So uh, this is you know, a, a condition or a, or a principle. And the same thing, no excuse in a sin. There's not, nothing that would be in the sharia would say it's okay to commit a sin. Unless it's a life and death situation. Like when is it permissible to eat pork, for example, to save your life? To the best of your ability, if you don't eat this, you will die. Then eat what is only necessary for you to keep yourself alive. Other than that, it's not permissible. This is with sins. And if, it's, uh, if it makes your life difficult, if you don't commit a sin, be patient. But you're still able to live. You're, still, you're not as rich as you want to be, but you're poor. It's okay. But you're able to live. You have a, a place to live in. You have food and drinks, things of that nature. The masail is only three. The first one, wujubu al wafai bin nathr. It's an obligation to fulfill the nathr. So now we learned subject in the fiqh with regards to a nathr. We have to fulfill the nathr and uh, you should not make nathr. So be at the ease of not making nathr. Some people think that this is the way to get something done. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that in the mayustakhraju, meaning bin al nathri min al bakhil, bin nathri min al bakhil. Uh, the greedy one, the Prophet والسلام, he said, the greedy one, uh, the, with the nazir, you get extracted from him something. He's greedy, he's not giving. So he would have to give only if he makes a nazir, if he makes a vow. So he falls sick, for example, so the only way that he would give is that he would make a nazir if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him cure, he will give this and this for the sake of Allah. Why don't you give for the sake of Allah when you're not sick? Or if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you cure, you don't have to make it as a condition. Just give for the sake of Allah. Do things and you get rewards for it. You don't have to make a nether. So stay away from it. But if you uh, made a nether, then it's an obligation to fulfill it. Number two, إذا ثبت كونه عبادة لله فصرفه إلى غير شرك. If uh, the nether was ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then making this ibadah to other than Allah is of course shirk. If someone makes the ibadah to other than Allah, if someone makes another to uh, make a sujood to a, a grave, for example, because he did not know or people told him that this is something is okay. Then he's not to fulfill it, of course, because this is shirk. الثالثة أن نذر المعصية لا يجوز الوفاء به To make nether with al-ma'asiyah, with matters of sins, is not permissible. And a person should not do it. And again, to add to this, that with expiation uh, of the sin. So this is the end of this chapter. And as you see with, with these matters of, of ilm or knowledge to safeguard the foundation of our deen and to learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, that's why the subject of the tawheed and the aqidah where we need to keep uh, knowing it and teaching it and, and to repeat it because that's the most important thing in our life. And that's why the people of Ahl sunnah you know, as Shaykh Hussain Tamir rahimahullah, he said, whom a'lam al-khalq bil-haqq, they are the most knowledgeable people of the truth. And وَأَرْحَمُ النَّاسِ بِالْخَلْقِ And they are the most merciful towards people. They have mercy towards people. And this is one of the characteristics, one of the signs of the people of Al-Sunnah, that they learn the deen. And they uh, educate themselves with regards to the haqq and the truth. And they have the concern towards others. They're not there to uh, be... Uh, you know, uh, mean to others, but rather they have mercy in their hearts towards others. How can they be saved from the punishment of Allah and how can they know the truth so that, so that they are upon it? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us uh, prevent, inshallah. Are you sure? I don't want to keep you late. The next chapter, inshallah. Bab min al-shirki al-isti'adatu bighayrillah. And by the way, these chapters, as you see, uh, there's a subject uh, in the shara even when, uh, with the, the issue of sadd al or to cut the leads to sins. Part of it, or a major part of it, is within the deen itself. Because sometimes it might be something that is not uh, with a direct evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah. The meanings of which is, you know, these things are forbidden for what reason? To protect the person from falling, or the wisdom behind it, to protect the person from falling into the major shirk. Right? So what leads to it is forbidden. The same thing, zina is forbidden. Adultery is forbidden. This is a major sin. And what the things that leads to it, you would find it also forbidden. 
So that's why you recommend it to lower the gaze, not to be uh, alone with a man and woman alone and uh, not touching and things of that nature so that the person is protected. It doesn't mean that if it's forbidden, for that reason, that means if I do these small sins, it's okay as long as it doesn't lead to the other one. No, because it's forbidden in itself. There's text, there's wahi, there's Quran and Sunnah, the Prophet والسلام, that forbids these sins that would lead, whether it leads or it doesn't lead, it's still forbidden. Uh, and therefore, sometimes if a person, the only way for him to commit a specific sin, and he knows himself, you know, a specific individual, once he sees him, uh, the sin becomes very easy for him. So that means do not see that person. You know yourself. You know your weakness. So we have to have that understanding of our own selves because every time you see that person, then things fall apart. So that means you have to protect yourself. So it teaches us that whatever is forbidden, we have to make barriers between us and what's forbidden to protect our hearts and to protect our honor and dignity. As the Prophet ﷺ said also in the halal and the haram hadith. So from a shirk al isti'adha from matters of shirk is to make istaada to say a'udhu uh, by other than Allah. And al istaada is to seek refuge in uh, someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is shirk. Al istaada, when we say a'udhu billahi min al shaytan al rajim, this istaada is an act of ibadah and it's only to be done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not as it means linguistically you seek refuge in someone. In a, in a matter where a human being is able to do that, something else. But the word a'udhu or al-isti'adha is only to Allah. In the things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. So for example, if someone is um, you know, uh, having an, you know, in the middle of the ocean, for example, and they're seeking help from uh, the, the people to come and save them, that's fine. You're not making shirk or anything. You're asking help from human beings where the human beings can do that. But if someone asks a human being something that the human beings have no capacity to do it because it's not something for them. For example, someone would be in his room or in his house and uh, a thief enters in the house. And he says, oh, uh, so and so, that righteous guy in the grave, help me. You know, this guy is not with him. If he calls the police, that's fine. This is permissible, of course. Uh, he runs away, he takes the means. All of that is good. But some crazy people, they would say, oh, uh, Badawi, help me, or Jilani, help me, or someone, uh, or even, oh, Prophet of Allah, help me. If he says, oh, Allah, help me, perfect, mashallah. So this is, comes into the level or the category of shirk, because he's calling other than Allah in the ways that these individuals, these creation of Allah has no means or capacity or any validity whatsoever. So al istaada is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word al istada seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all kinds of sorts of evil. So al istada bi ghayri la shirk. Wa qawli lahi ta'ala wa anna hu kana rijalu min al-insi ya'udhuna bi rijali min al-jinni fa zaduhum raqa. That some men of the human beings, they used to ya'udhun. The word ya'udhun, that means they seek refuge from the jinn. So fa zaduhum raqa, the jinn increased their miseries. And they seek refuge in the jinn by disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they would seek refuge in the jinn to commit evil and things of that nature. So they made this al istaada and they would, the Arabs used to, for example, when they travel in the times of Jahiliyyah, if they come down to rest uh, during the night, they would have to give allegiance to the leader of the jinn of uh, that place in the desert. So they would slaughter an animal or they would say words that they're seeking refuge uh, in the jinn or in the leader of the jinn, so that nothing would harm them. Right? This is all shirk, of course, and it's a very obvious thing. Uh, the next, uh, which is the hadith, وعن خولة بنت حكيم رضي الله عنها قالت سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من نزل منزلا فقال أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق لم يضره شيء حتى يرحل من منزله ذلك. And the hadith is reported by Imam Muslim, which means من نزل منزلا whoever comes down in a place, and usually it's referred to when you're traveling. So you're going to a place and you nazalta manzilan, that means you came down from your camel, you came down from the plane, you came down from the train, and now you're settled in a place, a town, or uh, people would, you know, they stop in rest areas and used to be in the past, openness in the desert, in the jungle, whatever there is. So it doesn't have to be an open place, any place. You go to a strange place to you, 
And the person, if he says, أعوذ بكلمات الله تمت, I seek refuge in Allah, I seek refuge in the words of Allah, in the perfect words of Allah. من شر ما خلق, from the evil of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. If he says this, and we'll talk about what كلمات الله, if he says, أعوذ بكلمات الله تمت, I seek refuge in the perfect and complete words of Allah, from the evil of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. If he says this, لم يضره شيء. Nothing will harm him. حتى يرحل من منزل ذلك. Till he leaves from that place where he settled in or he came down when he was traveling. So uh, the, why this hadith is mentioned here is أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات. I seek refuge in the perfect words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does that mean? Seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the kalimat of Allah, his names and attributes. And uh, the... Uh, which is basically the kalimat of Allah. You're seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and attributes. Uh, and this is the perfect names and attributes of Allah. The Quran is one of the attributes of Allah from the evil of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. So that means if a person seeks refuge in other than Allah, then he committed shirk. Because the ibadah, if it's done, the act of worship, it's done to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's associating partners with Allah. The benefits here, five points. The first one, tafsir ayah the tafsir of uh, the ayah, uh, how the, the human beings, some of them would seek refuge in the jinn. Uh, and this ayah, by the way, in Surah Al-Jinn, uh, it's, uh, it's after stating that they are mushrikeen. Right? So this is one of the characteristics of the mushrikeen. So this is a matter of shirk. Uh, the second thing, kawnuhu min shirk that this is from a shirk to seek refuge in the jinn. And some people till today, they do the same. Those who deal with jinn, this is all forms of shirk. And when it comes to sihr, which is prevalent and it's present, the sihr is a sahir kafir. A sahir is a disbeliever. The sorcerer, why? Because he would never commit or do acts of sihr, sorcery, unless he disbelieves in Allah. The jinn would not help him unless he would curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or do evil actions that basically it's all kufr, disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third one, al-istidlalu ala dhalika bil hadith, the evidence as mentioned in the hadith, لأن العلماء استدلوا به على أن كلمات الله غير مخلوقة قالوا لأن الاستعادة بالمخلوق شرك. And this is a beautiful benefit here. The hadith is أعوذ بكلمات الله. I seek refuge in the words of Allah, the perfect words of Allah. The words of Allah, are they creation of Allah or they are an attribute of Allah? Attribute of Allah. كلمات الله غير مخلوقة. This is an important matter of aqidah. Uh, matter of belief. The Quran is, is kalamullah, is the speech of Allah, is not makhluk, is not creation of Allah. So the ulama, they said, since you say, a'udhu bi kalimatillah, which is the words of Allah, which is not a creation of Allah, therefore, to seek refuge in the makhluk, in the creation of Allah, is shirk. So uh, this is very, anything that is makhluk, you don't seek refuge in the makhluk from whatever evil that you fear. Uh, and kalimatullah is not makhluk, it's the words of Allah. Number four, fadila to have dua ma'a ikhtisari. The virtue of this dua, even though it's short. And that's why one of the benefits of what we're learning is to memorize this dua. A'udhu bi kalimati allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq. Say, A'udhu bi kalimati allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq. A'udhu bi kalimati allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq. We're saying that to memorize it. Not to seek blessings by saying it, but just to memorize it. So, and it's, it's something to be said three times in the evening. It's from the Athkar of the Prophet والسلام, taught his ummah to say it. You don't have to be a traveler. Every evening to say it three times. أعوذ بكلمات الله التام ماتي من شر ما خلق. If a person says it, nothing will harm him, inshallah ta'ala. The last point, أن كون الشيء يحصل به منفعة دنيوية من كف شر أو جلب نفع لا يدل على أنه ليس من الشرك. It also a beautiful benefit here, which basically means something that you would get a, a worldly benefit from it, whether it's to push away harm or evil or to bring benefit, does not mean necessarily that this is not shirk. So if someone does something and he benefits as a result of this, does that mean that what he did is good? Meaning, does the end justify the means? No, this is not in the deen of Allah. The end has to be according to the deen, and the means has to be according to the deen. So if someone benefits from the jinn, if someone benefits from the jinn, does that make it permissible? Of course not. If someone benefits from selling drugs, 
Does that make selling drugs permissible because he makes a lot of money? Of course not. So it, things are not according to the benefits. Things is according to how being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same thing with the outcome of one's actions. Like for example, a brother, he was saying that because he was staying away from uh, a specific matter of haram, uh, he's been poor. Right? This is what he's explaining according to his situation. Of course, Allah knows best how many evil has been pushed away from him. But his colleagues or whatever, they become so rich now, but he's poor. The covenant between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is not about benefiting ourselves in this dunya. If someone continues to be poor because he's obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this by itself is a karama, is a great honor and a favor from Allah that he's steadfast upon the deen of Allah till he dies on that state. Because afterwards, if the reward is saved for him, for him then he is the... He would never wish otherwise because he returns to the mercy of Allah. But it's by the mercy of Allah because we're weak. Whoever is obedient to Allah, he would see the effect of that in his heart, in his uh, life. And he would see the, the, the beauty of it in his heart. And people might look at him from a distance that, oh, this poor man is in a bad situation. But in what's in his heart is such a, a feel of tranquility and benefits that is far more than anything or any wealth on the face of earth. So uh, this is the last one about the benefits is not necessarily related to things to be valid or to things to be not in the state of shirk. So, and one chapter after the other, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from all matters of shirk and associating partners with Allah uh, and to give us the, the benefiting knowledge and the righteous actions that is uh, as a result of that, inshallah.